In this section, we'll cover using the instance operator to repeat, arrange, and vary shapes in a scene. It builds on topics introduced earlier in the intro series, so I recommend watching several sections before this one, including concepts, SDFs and combiners, repetition filters, and variables. We'll cover two approaches to positioning instances, with range transform and then using a chop. We'll be using version 0.31 of the toolkit, so make sure you're using at least that version. Check the video description for a download link. Start by dropping the toolkit talks into your project. I like to do that at the root, outside of the main comp, but you can put it anywhere you like. First, we'll set up our renderer. Open the palette using the Alt-R shortcut and create a Raymarch Render 3D. Then add a null top connected to the first output so you can see the rendered image. With the renderer selected, open RayTK's Editor Tools menu with Alt-Shift-R. Then under Add Camera, we're going to choose Look at Camera. Select the renderer again, and open the Editor Tools menu again. And then under Add Light, we're going to choose Point Light. Then on the light, we're going to change the position to 4, 3, 4. Next, we'll create the STF that we'll be instancing. Open the palette again and create an octahedron STF. And connect that to the first input on the renderer. On the octahedron, decrease the radius to 0 0.3. Next, create an instance operator and insert that between the octahedron and the renderer. The instance operator is similar to the radial clone operator that we covered in the repetition filters section. When the renderer asks it for the closest surface to a point in space, it asks its input multiple times and then combines the results. But unlike Radial Clone, by default, it doesn't apply any transformation to the copies. That's why currently it doesn't seem to be doing anything. It's combining two octahedron surfaces, but since they're identical and they're in the same position, it just looks like one. To vary the position, we'll need to access information about which copy is being requested and use it to change the behavior of the input SDF. The first approach that we'll look at is using range transform. So open the palette again and create a range transform operator. And we're going to insert that between the octahedron SDF and the instance operator. On the range transform, decrease the X part of translate one to negative one, then increase the X part of translate two to positive one. Now the two instances are positioned at those two locations. But what if we want more than two copies? On the instance operator, change the instance count to four. It still looks like it's just two instances though, so what's going on here? On the range transform, decrease the X part of translate two down to zero. And you'll see how we're getting the third and fourth copy, but they're kind of outside of that range of positions. It's doing that because of how range transform is scaling the indices that it's getting from the instance operator. On the range transform, there's a setting at the top for the range of indices that it expects. Right now it sets the default of 0 to 1, and then it's set to extend linearly outside that range. So 0 gets the first translate setting, the second one gets the second translate setting, and then after that it just continues in that same direction. One option to fix this is to change the index range so that the upper bound matches the instance count minus 1. But there is an easier and more flexible approach. Before we get into that, let's talk about how range transform knows which copy it's being applied to. Right now it's using a system called iteration. 
Iteration is a way for the instance operator to include extra information when it requests a result from its input. In this case, it includes the number of the copy, 0, 1, 2, and so on. Iteration has limitations, though, because of how it works internally. In general, it has been deprecated in favor of using variables. Refer back to the variables section of the intro series for more information about what variables are and how they work. To use a variable instead, we need to get a reference to the variable provided by the instance operator. To select the instance operator and open the editor tools menu with Alt Shift R, and then under reference variable, let's look at the options there. So the first option is index, and this is going to be basically the same thing that iteration was doing of you know, 0, 1, 2, so on. The second option is normalized index, which scales that to a 0 to 1 range, depending on how many copies there are. So let's use that one. So now, regardless of how many copies we have, it's always going to scale those numbers into a 0 to 1 range. So the first copy is always going to be 0, and the last one's always going to be 1, and then the ones in between that will have values between those two. Connect the variable reference to the second input on the range transform, the index field input. Then on the range transform, make sure that you have the index range back at 0 to 1, since that's now the range that it's getting. Now when we increase the x part of the second translate back up to 1, we get four copies spread between those two positions. On the instance operator, increase the count to 16, but don't go much above 16 for now, or you may crash touch designer. We'll discuss why later on. Next, we can add some rotation. On the range transform, switch on enable rotate, and then use the two different rotate parameters to set the rotation of the instances on each end of that series. Next, we can use the normalized index variable to vary the radius of the octahedrons. Create a wave field operator. And we're going to connect that to the radius field input on the octahedron SDF. Then we're going to connect our variable reference up to the first input, the coordinate field input on the wave field. To avoid having zero or negative radius values, increase the offset to around 0.5 and then drop the amplitude down to around 0.3. That way we get radiuses ranging from 0.2 to 0.8. Try adjusting the phase parameter on the wave field to shift that pattern along the series of instances. This would be a good parameter to animate using something like a speed generator, but we aren't going to be covering that in today's video. Before we continue, we should take a minute to discuss performance. If you're familiar with geometry instancing in a traditional rendering workflow in Touch Designer, you may try to increase the count up to large numbers. Well, that works okay when you're using regular GPU instancing and you can get very large numbers of copies there, it doesn't work so well with ray marching. If you increase the rate too high, you're going to get really low frame rates or possibly even crash touch designer entirely. Within ray marching, recall from the concept section how, for each pixel in the output, the renderer asks its input about a series of points along a line coming from the camera and then going out into the scene. At each point along that path, it asks its first input what the closest surface is to that point. And then it uses that to decide whether to take another step or if it's hit a surface. So all the work of the whole chain of operators that are connected to that first input gets repeated potentially many times for every pixel of the rendered image. So when it does that here with an instance operator, it asks the instance about a point in space. The instance operator then 
sets up the variables for the first instance. Then it asks its input, which goes through this whole chain here. Then the answer comes back down. Then it sets up the variables for the second instance, goes back up again, answer goes back down. And it repeats this process now 16 times. And then it combines the results into a single surface. And then it provides that answer back down to the renderer. So then the renderer hasn't hit anything yet. It steps the point along the ray just in another distance. And then it repeats that entire process. So when you have an instance operator set to 16, it's performing all of this work upstream of it 16 times as often as it would if this were set to a count of one. And all of this work, everything connected to that first input itself, happens many times per pixel. So it's easy for that to overload your GPU. And when that happens, you'll get a significant drop in performance. And if it goes further than that, you could potentially crash touch designer entirely. So it's important to keep the count relatively low, and when you want to increase it, move it up in small increments and check your performance as you go. And make sure to save before doing that. Another thing that you may notice when changing the count is that especially for more complex scenes, TD is going to stall when you change the count. It does this because the count parameter is handled in a special way that bakes it into the shader code rather than passing it like a normal parameter. This can significantly improve performance when it's running, but it means that when it changes, the shader has to recompile. So I recommend typing values into that parameter rather than dragging the slider, especially when you have a more complex scene. Next, we'll look at using a chop to position copies instead of a range transform. We'll do this in a second chain of operators swapped in for the first chain. So open the palette again, and let's create a sphere SDF. And then we're going to connect that to the renderer instead of that other instance operator. On the sphere SDF, we're going to drop the radius down to around 0.1. Then create an instance operator. And we're going to insert that between the sphere SDF and the renderer. On the instance operator, switch on the enable transform setting. This opens up a few additional parameters. There's a reference to a chop that provides values, and then there's two switches for enabling translate and enabling rotate. We're going to be using just translate here, so we won't be covering rotate. When translate is set, the chop that it gets here, it expects to have a channel TX, TY, and TZ. And then if rotates on, it expects RX, RY, RZ. You can also include only some of those channels, and it will assume values of zero for the others. So if you want to only include TX and TY, it'll just assume that Z is always zero. To produce our chop, we'll start with a SOP. So create a circle SOP, and then add a null to the output of that. Then to convert this into a chop, we're going to create a SOP to chop and drag the null onto its SOP parameter then add a null chop to the output. We can call this something like positions. Then we're going to drag that chop onto the transform chop parameter on the instance operator. This positions some copies, but it's currently only using the first two samples in the chop. This is because for performance reasons, the instance operator uses its own count parameter rather than changing it dynamically based on the length of the chop that it's provided. So we're going to increase our count here up to 20. Then on the circle stop, drop the division setting down to 20 to match. <laughs> 
Now we've got one copy of that SDF per point in the input SOP. On the circle SOP, you can try adjusting the radius parameters and it will move those instances to match where the points are in, this, in the SOP. This works, but if all we wanted to do was arrange things in a circle, we could have done that with radial clone or even a modulo polar if we didn't need them to overlap. To add some variety, let's create a sprinkle SOP and we're going to insert that between the circle SOP and the null. Then drop the number of points down to 20. And now that takes that area of the input shape and then scatters 20 points within that area. And then those are the positions that we end up using for our sphere SDF. On the sprinkle sub, change the seed parameter to change the layout of those randomized positions. Now, because this is all going through chops, we can do things like smooth value changes. So let's create a filter chop and we're going to insert that between our sop to chop and the null. Then you're going to switch on filter per sample. So now if we go back to our sprinkle and you change the seed, it's going to smoothly move those points from one set of locations to the next. So this could be controlled with something like a button or a sensor or something like that. Now, if you want, you could also vary the radius of those spheres using an approach similar to what we did above with this wave field and a variable reference. But note that if you're copying and pasting variable reference operators, you may encounter problems since they stay linked to the operator that originally created them. So the best approach there is to just recreate a new variable reference and use that instead of copying and pasting. So far, the instance operators that we've been using have been combining their copies using the simple union method. But there are lots of other options. So on the instance operator, change this combine mode from simple union to smooth union, and then drop the blend radius down to around 0 0.1, maybe 0 0.2. So this gives you all the same options that are available on the combine operator or the arrange operator. But note that for some of them, like any of the intersect modes, you're probably going to get an empty result because in order for that to work, all of the copies would have to be overlapping in some areas. And that's it for this section. Stay tuned for the next video in the series. Check out my Patreon for early access to tutorials, exclusive scene downloads, and more. Thanks for watching, and make sure to like and subscribe.